Hello everybody, welcome back to the Trading Post. Uh, this is Noodle in his Halloween costume, Mr. Skellington. <laughs> and I'm just a regular Scarecrow guy. Uh, I think I'm going to have to take a break because he's getting a little antsy. And I'm going to take this off because I can't read what we got going on. But our episode is, this is episode 7. And we're going to do the origins of monsters. The werewolf, vampires, Frankenstein, witches, and uh, the headless horseman as well. So, stay tuned. Welcome back, everybody. Sorry about that. I just couldn't see through that mask. But hopefully you got a nice little peek of our, our Halloween costumes. And maybe you got a little kick out of Noodle. <laughs> yeah, he fought me a good bit. It was tough trying to even just get him in his little outfit. Anyways, <clears throat> let's go ahead and get started on this. I hope you guys are going to enjoy this episode because uh, it was actually kind of fun looking up this stuff and researching some stuff. But uh, we're going to start out with the werewolf. All right. Okay, it's unclear exactly when and where the werewolf legend originated. Some scholars believe the werewolf made its debut in the Epic of Gilgamesh. That's a long time ago. <laughs> when Gilgamesh jilted a potential lover because she had turned her previous mate into a wolf. All right. So, how was this curse created? The first werewolf was created by the witch Inadu as revenge against her tribe for killing her. And before her death, she turned every member of the tribe into a werewolf. While the origins of the werewolf gene are supernatural, every future werewolf could only contract the disease genetically. What about sightings? Uh, the first supposed werewolf sighting was in the countryside between the towns of Cologne and Bedburg in Germany in 1589. A pamphlet was drawn up by those who claimed to have witnessed it, which was then distributed around the towns. Often, uh, let's see here, what does a werewolf symbolize? Okay. Often associated with untamed energies, trickery or deceit, interpreted as the struggle between and the integration of both good and evil within a human being. The inescapable and uncontrollable nature of our raw emotion urges, emotional urges sexual aggression, etc. Um, you know, who was the first real werewolf, supposedly? Let's see. In Ovid's version, Ly Lycaon murdered and mutilated a protected hostage of Zeus, but suffered the same consequences. He was now transformed into a wolf. Ovid's Lycaon is the, Lycan is the origin of the modern werewolf. As the physical manipulation of his body hinges on his prior immoral behavior. And who was a werewolf in the Bible? Okay. Nebuchadnezzar II is considered to be the first ever and probably only werewolf in the biblical texts. And as such, his, he is probably one of the most powerful werewolf on earth. Only behind Lycan. As, as a lycanthrope, he naturally behaves wolf-like. Its appearance is beastly. It has, it has sharp teeth and claws on its hands and feet. Okay. And what was the most famous werewolf in history? Okay. Perhaps the most infamous example was the case of Peter Stump, executed in 1589. The German, farm, the German farmer and alleged serial killer and cannibal, also known as the Werewolf of Bedburg. What is the pagan symbol for werewolf? In heraldry, the vertical form of the Z with a line through it uh, is associated with Donnerkill or Thunderbolt. And the horizontal form of this symbol is associated with the werewolf. Early medieval pagans believed that the wolf's angel symbol possessed magical powers and could ward off wolves. That's interesting. See, it's nice to learn some new stuff. Hopefully you guys take something from this, at least learn something. Who is the most feared werewolf? The primordial werewolves are the second werewolves 
as such, are the most feared and most powerful of all in existence. They first came into existence in the beginning of 7000 BC. There are ten of them in total. They existed along with the primordial vampires in the original witch. Okay, um, and what is, what's the life expectancy of, of a werewolf? Around 1,700 years is their life expectancy. Where they get this, I don't know, but I, I pulled this. <laughs> so I pulled this stuff up, and this is what I come up with. So the disease isn't real. Lycanthropy, lycanthropy is a rare psychiatric phenomenon seen in the context of various neuropsychiatric conditions and not a disorder itself. Its differenti differentials include schizophrenia, delusional disorder, bipolar disorder, psychotic depression, epilepsy, organic causes. However, its presence is rare. And what are the three forms of werewolves? The human, the wolf, and the werewolf. Or homid form, lupus form, and crinos form, which human form is homid form, wolf form is lupus form, and the werewolf is the crinos form. Okay, what is a half-blood? Half-bloods are the result of a birth of a birth and not an infection. They are the result of a full werewolf and full human in union. What are examples of legends? One, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Two, Greek mythology. And three, Nordic folklore is where you'll see this as examples. And uh, I'm sure you're going to be surprised with this because uh, this was news to me. I didn't know, really know anything about this part of this. Uh, but there was what they called uh, the werewolf trials. Never heard of that. But I'm going to start reading this for you. In 1521, Frenchman Pierre Burgot and Michael Verdun allegedly swore allegiance to the devil and claimed to have an ointment that turned them into wolves. After confessing to brutally murdering several children, they were both burned at the stake. Another one, number two, Giles Garnier was known as the werewolf of Dull. He was, uh, was another 16th century Frenchman whose claim to fame was also ointment with wolf morphing abilities. According to legend, as a wolf, he viciously killed children and ate them. He too was burned at the stake. Whether Burgot, Verdun, or Garnier were mentally, mentally ill, acted under the influence of a hallucinogen, or were simply cold-blooded killers is up for debate. But, it like, but if likely, it likely didn't matter to superstitious Europeans during the 16th century. To them, such crimes can, could only be committed by a horrific werewolf. Number three, Peter, St Peter Stubb, a healthy or a wealthy 15th century farmer in Bedburg, Germany, may be the most notorious werewolf of them all. According to folklore, he turned into a wolf-like creature at night and devoured many citizens of Bedburg. Peter was eventually blamed for the gruesome killings after being cornered by hunters who claimed they saw him shapeshift from wolf to man. He experienced a grisly execution after confessing under torture to, savage, to savagely killing animals, men, women, and children, and eating their remains. He also declared he owned an enchanted belt that gave him the power to transform into a wolf at, well, at will. Not surprising, the belt was never found. Peter's guilt is controversial since some people believe he wasn't a killer, but the victim of a political witch hunt, or perhaps a werewolf hunt. Either way, the circumstances surrounding his life and death stoked rampant fears at the time werewolves were on the loose. All right, and that does that for werewolves. If you guys have any other information or anything you'd like to add to things, you can comment. Just put it in the comments, you know. If you want to, click that notification bell. You'll get notifications anytime I come up with another uh, video. So let's go ahead and move on here. I don't want to make this too long for you guys because I know sometimes these videos when they run a little long it gets a little boring and I don't want to do that I want to keep it fresh I want to keep it going for you guys all right and the next subject we're going to do is the vampires okay so the vampire post dates witch hunts werewolf trials and even demon haunting puritans or demon haunted puritan puritans sorry about that 
Okay. The concept of, of the vampire as an undead creature inflicting harm originated in Eastern Europe, specifically in Bulgaria, a thousand years ago. Make no mistake, this was a legend isolated among the Slavic people. Okay, who was the first vampire? Jure Grando Alilovic, or Jure Jure Grando, 1579 to 1656, was a villager from the region of Istria in modern-day Croatia, who may have been the first real person described as a vampire in historical records. He was referred to as a strigan, a local word for, this, for something resembling a vampire and a warlock. Okay, so what is the what is the oldest origin of vampires? The first known reference to vampires appeared in written form in Old Russian in A.D. 1047, soon after Orthodox Christianity moved to into um, Eastern Europe. So, did vampires come from Egypt? That's interesting, huh? The first vampire story is is. Uh, tough to pinpoint, but seeds of the modern concept have appeared in mythology since the beginning of recorded history. The story of Sekhmet, the Egyptian feline warrior goddess associated with both plague and healing, is considered by some to be the oldest of vampire tales. That's interesting. Um, okay, what is uh, the origin of staking vampires? The idea of staking the undead to pin them to their grave originates as a medieval southern Slavic practice associated with vampire epidemics. In these cases, exhumed bodies were considered to be unnatural because they were undecayed, bloodied, or apparently fatter than in life, hence not truly dead. Of course, they didn't know what we know today, so, yeah, take that with a grain of salt. Okay, who is the first vampire? The first vampire started out as not a vampire at all, but a human man named Ambrosio. He was an Italian-born adventurer who fate brought to Delphi in Greece. In a nutshell, a series of blessings and curses transformed this young man into history's first vampire. Hmm, that's kind of broad. I wouldn't... Anyways, well, maybe we can do a second part on each individual cryptid if you'd like. And I can break it down, maybe have more time to go into further detail with this stuff. I'm just trying to pinpoint some of the ones. Since this is Halloween, we want to try and cover some of these characters. And, and maybe learn a little bit. Okay, so um, what's the weaknesses? Why can't va vampires cross water? Well, vampires, as enemies of God and Christ, were naturally repelled or impaired or injured by symbols of baptism Hence, they can't cross running water and have some sort of aversion or painful reaction to holy water. So, all right, let's go to another weakness. Let's see. What's the other weakness? Weakness: uh, Garlic. Specifically, the chemical compound allicin inside garlic is a powerful antibiotic. Some European beliefs around vampires stated they were created by a disease of the blood, so a powerful antibiotic would kill a vampire. Also, some of the other weaknesses is wood. Now, some of the stuff that's prefer it's preferred that they mostly use the most common wood used on stakes was hawthorn, but they they, you, they say you could also use ash, aspen, willow, and or ju ju juniper. Um, another weakness is sunlight or UV rays. They have no melanin in their skin, which is what causes them to burn from the UV light or the sun. Silver also is a weakness to them due to the fact that silver is seen as pure. They are not. Therefore, it inflicts damage to them. So, what are the types of vampires? Let's go into it. There's three types of vampires according to this, what I, to this research. One is sangu sanguinarian, two psychic, and three hybrids, which would be a cross between... Probably human and vampire. Or, or I don't know. I would imagine that's what it is. Uh, it says sanguinarians feed on very small amounts of human blood, generally a few drops. They usually don't. <clears throat> they usually don't feed from the neck as the others 
the other types do. Okay, what's their lifespan? They live immortal lifespans despite their weak, these weaknesses, and it is fairly common for a vampire to be centuries old, although they still age slowly. A vampire who is 600 years old would appear to be a middle-aged person. That's something else. So what is a vampire? Uh, there are many different characteristics of vampires, as there, there are many let men as as there's many characteristics of vampires, as there are many le vampire legends. The main characteristic of vampires is they drink blood, human blood, typically by draining the victim's blood using their sharp fangs, killing them and turning them into vampires. In general, vampires hunt at night since sunlight we weakens their powers. Some may have the ability to morph into a bat or a wolf. They have super strength and dexterity, which means they're fast, and often uh, hypnotic sensual effects on victims. So they also do that. Now, here we get into the one that probably everybody knows, I'm sure of this. Vlad. Okay? It's thought that Bram Stoker named Dracula after Vlad Dracul, also known as Vlad the Impaler. Vlad was born in Transylvania, Romania. He ruled Wallachia, Romania off and on from 1456 to 1462. Some historians describe him as a, a just yet brutally cruel ruler who valiantly fought off the Ottoman Empire. He earned his nickname because his favorite way to kill his enemies was to impale them on a wooden stake. According to legend, he enjoyed dining amongst his dying victims and dipping his bread in their blood. Whether true, this is unknown. And there's another one. Here's another case, uh, supposed case. Mercy Brown may rival Dracula as the most notorious vampire. She lived in Exeter, Rhode Island, and was the daughter of George Brown, a farmer. After George lost many family members, including Mercy in the late 1800s to tuberculosis, the community used Mercy as a scapegoat. That's sad. To explain their deaths. When Mercy's body was exhumed and didn't display severe decay, the townspeople accused her of being a vampire and making her family sick. They cut out her heart, burned it, then fed the ashes to her sick brother. That's pretty sick. Not surprisingly, he died shortly after. That's news to me. I'd never, ever heard of that case, which that's frightening that they did something like that. That's sad. Anyhow... Um, that's about it for the vampires. Now, we got a little, I only got a little bit on Frankenstein because, you know, we'll, we'll get into it here. But Frankenstein is the next one. The Modern Prometheus, the book written by 20-year-old Mary Shelley, is frequently called the world's first science fiction novel in the story of a scientist, uh, in, a, in the story, a scientist animates a creature constructed from dismembered corpses. The gentle, intellectually, the gentle, intellectually gifted creature is enormous and hideous. Cruelly rejected by his creator, he wanders, seeking companionship and becoming increasingly brutal as he fails to find a mate. She, Mary Shelley, created the story in 1816 in Geneva. The, the doctor, Victor Frankenstein, was based on real-life researchers and their experiments. Due to experiments that were cruel and unjust at the current time, the story was written, at this time, you had experiments and grave robbers, so it, was, it wasn't completely just an imaginary story. Who knows? Maybe there is a Frankenstein today. What's your thoughts on that? Makes you think. I mean, look at what all we got available nowadays. There's a lot going on, a lot of technology... Who knows? All right, let's jump into the next one. Witches, which has been around for, seems like forever. But, okay, let's start it off. It's unclear exactly when witches came onto the historical scene, but one of the earliest records of a witch is in the Bible, in the, the book of one, uh, 1 Samuel, thought to be written between 931 B.C. and 721 B.C. 
It tells the story of when King Saul sought the witch of Endor to summon the dead prophet Samuel's spirit to help to help him defeat the Philistine army. The witch roused Samuel, who then prophesied the death of Saul and his sons. The next day, Saul's sons died in, a, in battle, and Saul committed suicide. Okay, now, you got witch hysteria really took hold in Europe during the mid-1400s. When many accused witches confessed, often under torture, to a variety of wicked behavior. Within a century, witch hunts were common and most of the accused were executed by burning, burning at the stake or hanging. Single women, win, widows, and other women on the margins of society were especially targeted. Between the years 1500 and 1660, up to 80,000 suspected witches were put to death in Europe. That is insane. 80,000 people. Wow. Around 80% of them were women thought to be in cahoots with the devil and filled with lust. Germany had the highest witchcraft execution rate, while Ireland had the lowest. That's interesting. The book Malleus Maleficarum, written in 1486, likely spurred witch mania to go viral usually translated as the hammer of witches, was essentially a guide on how to identify, hunt, and interrogate witches. Okay, now, this is a famous point in time that, it's sad, but it happened, Salem Witch Trials. In January of 1692, a group of young girls in Salem, Massachusetts, became consumed by disturbing Fits accompanied by seizure, seizures, violent contortions, and blood-curdling screams. One of the most famous witches in Virginia's history is Grace Sherwood, whose neighbors said she killed their pigs and hexed their cotton. She was brought to trial in 1706. She wasn't killed after being found guilty, but put in prison for eight years. Hmm. It's a good little bit on the witches. Now, we're going to start with the last subject, okay? The Headless Horseman. You don't really hear much about him, which that's why I was kind of really interested to try and dig into this one a little bit. So, I hope you guys like what, what information I was able to bring to the table today. Um, so, let's, let's continue on. The Headless Horseman. Washington Irving's in 1820, tale of Sleepy Hollow of a Headless Horseman terrorizing the village of Sleepy Hollow, is considered one of America's first ghost stories. But Irving didn't invent the idea of a headless rider. Hmm. So it's bef this predates 1820. So it's been around for a while. Tales of headless horsemen can be traced to the Middle Ages, including stories from the Brothers Grimm and Dutch and Irish legend of the Dullahan or the or the Gonsian, a Grim Reaper-like rider who carries his head. It is believed Irving was likely influenced by Sir Walter Scott's 1796 The Chase, although there are many who think he was inspired by an actual Hessian soldier who was decapitated by a cannonball during the Battle of White Plains around Halloween 1776. That's interesting. It's also thought he was introduced to ghost stories at an impressionable age. He cleverly weaves together factual locations, some actual family names, and a little bit of Revolutionary War history with pure imagination. So it's a culmination of all. And, uh, and fantasy. It's said it's a melting pot of a story, which uh, I can understand that. The horseman supposedly seeks revenge and a head which he thinks was unfairly taken from him. This injustice demands that he continually search for a substitute. The horseman, like the past, still seeks answers, still seeks retribution, and cannot rest. Okay, um, in closing, what are, you th what are your thoughts on these subjects? I mean, do you think any of this stuff has factual basis? I mean, it seems like some of it does. Uh, 
Or is it all just puppy cock? You be the judge. I mean, if you want, you know, I could do a, I can do a part two on any specific one of these or or all if you would like. Just do a whole other second special of this. But you have to let me know. I want to do what you want me to do. Okay? I'm looking in, I'm interested. I'm interested in all kinds of subjects, so I'll do anything. It doesn't matter to me. But I want to hear from you. I want to hear what you want. Okay? I'm trying to do stuff that you guys may have an interest in that maybe you might spark something that maybe I'm not thinking about. Um, you know, what do you think? Are any of these possibly real or none of them? I mean, could they be? Well, I mean, some of it's not really too far fetched. I mean, there has been cannibalistic people um, that have been known. Uh, I'm sure there's been people that have drank blood. I mean, things of that sort. So, yeah, technically there could be really vampires that have been out there. And there also, I mean, as far as the Frankenstein thing, that could have been true. That could have been a true story. I mean, the scientists, scientists back then was actually experimenting with a lot of stuff. They was experimenting with dead cadavers and things of that sort. So who's to say they didn't take an arm off and sew it onto this guy or, you know, do like a mix and match some type of crazy controversial experiment. It's not far-fetched, you know. doesn't mean that it didn't happen. It could be a possibility. But that's up to you to decide. I mean, it's not too far away, far-fetched. As far as witches, I mean, we know that there's such things as Wiccans and, and um, you know, I'm not going to compare them to this or that because I, my knowledge of that is very limited. But you have different stuff. You have uh, witchcraft books and, and black magic and things of that sort. I mean, you have voodoos, you know, voodoo priestesses and stuff like that. And now, I don't know much about them as well, so I'm not degrading anything. But I am going to say this. If those are around and there is has been people claiming that this stuff is real, that they can do that, like Santeria and all this other stuff. It's not completely far-fetched. I don't believe. I mean, I really don't believe it's too far-fetched. And as far as a headless headless horseman, that's ab that has absolutely had to have happened over the centuries, throughout war. I mean, like they were saying about the guy... They thought it was originated from uh, White Plains, where a guy got decapitated by a cannon, a freaking cannonball, and that's that's very possible. It could decapitate him, and he was still in the saddle and riding down the, the field. I mean, people they've done that in, in battles. It's it's happened. It's known to have happened. So that is a story that is steeped in truth. I I really strongly think so. I mean, not as not as far as the the retribution for trying to get ahead, you know, that's that's a whole other deal there. But could it be possible that it's a specter of, of a of a ghost wanting to be a, of wanting to avenge itself? But hey, it could be. Who knows? Maybe it is possible. I don't know. But I think these are all interesting. I mean, werewolves. You know, you got werewolves, the, the dog men. Uh, cryptids and stuff like that, like uh, Bigfoot, people have seen, seen sightings of them, things like that, have encountered them. There's been people that have had their cars actually cut open like a can opener from the, the claws. And they always say that they have amber-colored eyes when light hits them. That's not human. Humans, their eyes do not do that at night. We're not like a deer. We're not nocturnal animals, creatures like that. Now, who knows? Maybe evolutionary, if we lived in caves and stayed away from society and had nothing but darkness we lived in, absolutely, our bodies would probably adjust and, and, and evolve to that surrounding, to that lifestyle. And maybe our eyes probably would change to amber. Maybe our our specific eyes, but our the generation down, if we had kids or whatever, in a setting like that, perhaps, yeah, they probably would be born with it like that. You you know, you'd start changing. 
I mean, it's, it is possible. But anyways, I want all of you, if you watch this, you, you know, you don't have to believe any of it. You don't have to believe it all. You know, it's entertainment. This is for entertainment purposes only for all of you. Okay? Educational and entertainment purposes. Any little piece of information you catch on this, that you actually learn something new, I, I'll be happy with that. I'm learning stuff each story I'm doing. So... I'm not no scholar, far from it, but I'm, I'm, I'm doing this because I want to personally learn myself. You know, I enjoy doing this. You know, I don't expect to get subscriptions, likes, and all that craziness. I, I really don't. But if I at least get people to watch, even if it's just a minute or two of each episode, that's fine. I'd like to see you just at least... Maybe if you watch the whole thing, maybe you'll, you'll learn something, you know, and at the very least, if you want, hit that little notification bell and you'll be notified for other videos when they come out. And this is the Halloween special, episode seven, the origins of monsters, the Halloween special. Thank you all for tuning into the trading post. And, uh, I think I'm going to do another one. Uh, I think my ne next episode perhaps may be Missing 411 Disappearances. And I'm going to try and do specifically in the Appalachian area. The Appalachian Mountain Ranges. The, um, yeah, the Appalachian Trail, etc. Up through there in the Bennington Triangle that goes all around that trail. The trail goes right through the middle. So anyways, we'll talk about that on that on that episode whenever I, I get it going. Okay? And it may be, sh may be sooner than you expect. Um, currently doing research on that. And we're going to go into cases on certain people that have disappeared. Uh, and and in the means that they have disappeared will we'll shock you. You know? I mean, but we're going to go through all that. We're going to talk about some different things and different theories. We're going to theorize about certain possibilities of how they disappeared, why they disappeared, and what caused them to disappear. You know. Until then, you guys, stay true to yourselves. All right? Find your own truth. Do your own research. If you're interested in the subject, dig into it. Find out what you can. And if you find out any information that I did not bring to light, I'm sorry. But I will be glad if you, if you comment Send me a comment about it and let me know what you find out. Send me your information. Because I'll be glad to do a um, an episode on that to rectify things. You know, maybe redo the episode or something. We'll figure that out. But we'll do that in time whenever that we hit that juncture. All right, everybody. You have a great day. Great night, whatever time it is when you're watching this thing. Um, Noodle, or Rocket, I like calling him Rocket, but his name is Noodle. So, he is ornery. You know how hard it was to get him in that daggone suit? It was rough. Yeah. Yeah. So, I knew I wasn't going to be able to keep him in it very long. <laughs> Now, if I could have seen through my mask, I'd have kept it on throughout the episode. But I couldn't read. I couldn't, you know, I wouldn't be able to give you the proper attention here and, and do what needed to be done. But anyways, y'all, have a great day. Be true to yourself. Seek your truth. Bye. Trading Post, post out.